Hello, Internet. Uh, I wanted to make another video about Copilot, so here I am. Uh, partly because people had responded a bit to my previous video, which was kind of fun. I've never had people actually comment on a video. <laughs> it's kind of neat. Uh, and the other reason was that I encountered something at work that I had, I don't know, led me down an interesting path of, of thinking uh, that I just thought was interesting. And, and also, uh, seemed adjacent to some complaints I'd seen that people had about Copilot. Uh, Copilot, I still think, is very fun. Um, it's definitely become maybe a little less fun and more of just like a tool that I'm using and, and wanting to rely on. Uh, so, so the initial like excitement is definitely wearing off, I guess is what I'm saying. But it's still a really cool tool, and, and I think it has its use. Um, and you know, I don't want to say whether or not all of our jobs will be replaced by AI, because I am in the camp. I think all of our jobs will be replaced by AI, and I don't know what in the world is going to happen to uh, the world when that happens, but I'm sure humans will figure something out. Uh, hopefully without too much trouble in between, but I guess we'll see what the future holds. Um, but in the meanwhile, yay, Copilot, it's fun. Um, so here's a problem I had at work, <laughs> getting back on topic. Um, we're doing a program that has some AD integrations or, or authenticating through AD. Um, and some of it is being done manually. So uh, I need to look up users, um, and there's also going to be an admin thing. Yeah, there's a couple of reasons. We need to uh, be able to search AD for users by various cr uh, criteria and all these things. Um, and the way to do that, I learned, because I don't know anything about <laughs> LDAP, is with an LDAP query. Who knew? Now I know. Um, I don't know. I took a networking class like literally 20 years ago. Yeah, that's true. I had to double check the year to make sure that's true. That's true. It was 20 years ago, maybe 21 years ago. So it's been a long time. If I ever learned LDAP, I've completely forgot that I ever learned. So so anyway, so I had to go and, and look up this stuff online. This is what an LDAP query looks like. Uh, this page is full of PowerShell um, commands, right? Dash D, blah, blah, dash W. I'm pretty sure, I assume this is PowerShell. Um, I'm used to PowerShell modern PowerShell stuff having like a, I shouldn't say PowerShell, it's like command line, right? This could probably be even traditional CMD, EXE or whatever command prompt. But but anyway, doesn't really matter. What's important is these, these little queries. This is what I need to write. Um, and in writing them, something I didn't think about, but fortunately I had been playing with various Roslyn analyzers and one of them pointed out, you could have an LDAP injection attack, the same, same as a SQL injection attack, right? If you write some SQL by hand, P.S. Please never do that. <laughs> um, you better be escaping your your quotation marks and things. There's a million reasons why you shouldn't be doing that. Okay, there's two good ones. One, existing libraries will do the escaping for you. Uh, two, no, they won't. They'll instead use the parameterized queries, and so the whole issue is sidestepped. But um, but anyway, for LDAP, we don't have those kind of tools. LDAP is not remotely as popular as SQL. Not remotely as widespread in use. And so we don't have these cool mature libraries that, that, that do stuff where you can do, you know, like you can do link queries. You could say, you know, people equals, you got some DB context, right? People where, and you say, you know, I want someone where their, their name is Ben, whatever, right? These are the sorts of things you could write. Of course, it's giving me many syntax errors because this is not the place to be writing this code. But, but you know, th that's the sort of code you can write with something like Entity Framework. It would be great if we could do that with, with LDAP, but we can't. So we, we have to write it by hand. Oh my goodness. Or at least to my knowledge. If By the way, if you know an awesome LDAP AD library, please tell me. <laughs> I would love to know so I can get rid of, of, of the solution that I came up with. Um, so yeah, anyway, you can have LDAP injection. Very bad. Um, and so I was looking online for, okay, I can't seem to find a library. Um, I'll escape it. I'll go old school and I can escape it myself. Um, the... Uh, you know, the, the user inputs before I put them into the query. Um, God, the more I talk about this, the more I'm very dissatisfied. And don't worry, this isn't released yet, and we're still working on it, so I, I still have opportunities to make it better. Uh, but anyway, um, how do we escape it? I looked online, I was having trouble finding anything, and then I thought, why not ask Copilot? Maybe Copilot knows. So um, let's ask Copilot. I don't know. I've been noticing this it's like getting cut off in a weird way because it's not stopping at E. If I press tab, it does the whole thing. So I think there's some weird display issue. Maybe if I restarted writer, I don't know. Also, as I mentioned, did I mention? Maybe I mentioned a previous time. I've tried to record this video several times and failed. And so it's still spoilers. We're going to do some Levenstein distance stuff, but don't worry about that. Uh, so let's ask um, a copilot. I'm feeling punchy now. Please <laughs> sanitize a string for use in an LDAP query. 
I don't know why I'm being smarmy now. I don't even know what the right adjective is. All right, so here, and this is basically what it has generated for me in the past. In fact, it might be identical. Sometimes it gives different results, which, you know, there's a lot going on. So anyway, um, and also we might note, huh, it keeps going, right? So, okay, a couple questions coming to mind. Okay, it's never given me that before. The hell? See, I don't know what's going on now. All right, so here's the questions you might have. A, when do I stop? When is it done? Um, be that same thing like like there, there's too little that i i know basically what i realized uh, um when i when i asked copilot was i'm unqualified in two ways a i don't know how to write the the sanitize algorithm b i don't know how to validate whether or not what it did is correct or or incorrect i can't write a unit test basically right i don't i don't even know how to do either one for 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 this particular problem. And that's a very bad place to be in, right? That means, uh oh, abort, stop, we need help, <laughs> right? Um, but I thought something that would be interesting to explore because of some stuff I saw people talking about Copilot was what if you do know how to at least verify that the job was done properly, but you don't know how to write the algorithm, right? That's another situation that, that I could have been in, it would, not for LDAP in this case, but maybe for other things, maybe for the Levenstein distance, for example. Um, and the stuff I've, I've seen people talk about online is, um, you know, oh, Copilot, oh no, it generates buggy code or, or insecure code or, or things like that, you know. Um, that seems like a bug with Copilot, <laughs> which is interesting to me. I, Copilot being trained on code, you know, written by humans, I would imagine that I don't think it's going to be as bad as humans. I don't know. This is this is a thing that's interesting with AI, right? But we're training it on stuff that users have given. And what users have provided, what humans have provided, contains bugs. And I don't know, what, you know, when can the AI outperform humans in terms of bugs? And when can it underperform? There are certainly examples where Copilot does both. So yeah, whether or not it's more or less buggy than the average human, it certainly is occasionally buggy or insecure or these other things. So I think, just like taking code from online, um, what you ought to do is unit test your code, um, and, and and that way we can right we can be sure even if we don't know how to write it, we can just ask Copilot. And if Copilot fails, okay, then we'll go back to the old school way of googling online or or whatever. Um, I still think if you can find a NuGet package or something that does it, you're probably better off. Especially if that NuGet package you know looks legit, it contains unit tests, it's by a name, or you're like, oh, that guy works for Microsoft, he, right? He probably knows what he's doing. You know, anything like that, you, you might get a sense that this library is, is trustworthy. Um, because at some point, that's what you have to do, right? Either you have to learn and become an expert, or, or you have to find someone who is, who wrote it, or, or someone who you trust to be. It's a, it's a weird situation to be. And I think about these things sometimes when I'm programming. I'm like, how confidently can I say that I've done the right thing? So anyway, so let's write some unit tests, and let's write for an algorithm that we don't know how to write. And again, spoiler alert, because I've tried to do this a couple times, Levenstein distance. Uh, the Levenstein distance is the number of changes you would need to get one string into another. So for example, cat into bat with one change, change the C to a B, you have got to bat. And so the Levenstein distance is one. Also, I don't know if I'm saying that name properly. Levenstein, 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 Leven, I don't know. Um, uh, additions to the string also are kind of a distance of one. So if you went from like cat to cats, uh, that would be a distance of one, or if you removed a single letter, so cat to ct would be okay, removed an A, right? Um, so th there are also some tricky situations, which I'll get into, that kind of like not, uh, where it could be ambiguous, like maybe there's two routes to get there. Um, one would take, you know, distance one or two. You want to find the shortest, right? So again, how do you write an algorithm to do this? I don't know, it seems complicated, but let's try asking Copilot, first of all, to do that. So I I'm going to rename this. Um, rename this to string extension. So I'm, I'm, there's a few ways you could do this. I'm going to do it as a string extension um, so that I would type, you know, cat dot Levenstein distance bat or something. Um, but it could also be, I don't know. I don't know how, you know, people have, <laughs> I guess I, I have a, uh, I've done JavaScript coding a lot longer than C sharp and uh, extending the base classes is something that people really don't like in the JavaScript world, but we don't have namespaces to help us out. It, I don't know, I always have hesitations and I don't know if people are gonna complain. It's like, no, don't extend base classes, that's, you know, bad, because it's really bad in the JavaScript world. But I, I feel like in C-sharp with namespacing, it's fine, so 
anyway, whatever, tangent. Uh, so let's make a function. We will call this, uh, so this will be public static, uh, sorry, int, because the distance is an integer. Also, I think this should probably be static. Um, so yeah, let's do Levenstein, did I spell that right? Hopefully. So we'll have uh, A and B. I guess that's what I'll call the strings. And let's see what it gives us, if anything. Compute the Levenstein distance between the two strings, sure. Okay, it's doing something. All right. It's interesting because there was one, oh, oh. there was one time I did this where it um, did the whole body in one, in one go, uh, but mostly it seems to want to take multiple attempts. All right, is this font big enough? I tried to make the font bigger. All right, so I mean, I think this is a really good example of like, wow, do you understand this at a glance? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, if you've done this before, maybe for computer science or something, I, I don't know. This wasn't a problem they gave us in was like data structures and algorithms or whatever, CS211 all those years ago. I don't remember us ever doing Levenstein distance there. I remember us like doing maze solving algorithms and stuff. So anyway, what I'm saying is you might look at this and be and have no clue, no basis for believing that this is good or not, right? Does this actually compute the Levenstein distance? I spelled Levenstein right, uh, wrong, rather. Uh, so I'm glad it figured it out. I knew I had somehow, but I couldn't see it in the moment. Okay. Uh, I knew only because of squiggly underlines, obviously. All right, so let's write a unit test because <laughs> I want to I want to know that I've done this right, um, or rather the copilot has. So we will call this test Levenstein distance as a unit test. Let me zoom in here. Uh, Rider does not quite support uh, .NET six. That namespace thing seems to confuse it. Uh, apparently, they have like a what do they call it. I don't know, they got some early access. Yeah, EAP, early access program or something, but I didn't I didn't sign up for it, so I'm just using what's currently released. Um, also, yeah, so in my last video, I used VS Code and had said that Rider wasn't supported. There is definitely a thread. Maybe I didn't look at the age of the thread when I read it, or, or, or maybe they... Anyway, there was definitely a thread where IntelliJ was like, hey, Copilot works for the IntelliJ platform, broadly speaking, but definitely not Rider. Either that was an old post and they had already fixed it, or they had fixed it since they made that video. I don't know, or since I made that video. I have no idea. Regardless, it is available for Rider now, which is wonderful. One thing I do miss is that in VS Code, you get like a little progress bar when um, when Copilot is thinking, and I've become very trained to like catch that out of the corner of my eye. Like some part of my brain is looking out for that when I'm half expecting, you know, Copilot to to be doing some work. So I, I wish we had that feedback in in Rider, but. Who knows? Anyway, um, so yeah, so here's some tests. Uh, let's make a test. So this will be uh, test Levenstein distance. So we'll have two strings. And subject under test will be, let's do Levenstein distance. Probably doesn't have a reference. Yep. All right. Ugh. Writer is so much better than VS Code. <laughs> um, also, I don't happen to like the built-in assert. Let me get, um, I'm trying to remember what the thing is called now at the top of my head and I'm being watched. Oh good, Fluent Assertions. Ah yes, I had already searched for it because again, I've already tried to record this video before. How nice of it to remember. And I was like, oh, I'm forgetting again. All right, so we can say um, this should be uh, the expected value, which I haven't, um, passed in. So that's the other thing we need for the test, right? We need the two strings and we need what is the distance? What do we expect the distance to be? That's an interesting suggestion. I mean, that's not bad. Um, that's interesting. Did it, does it see my using of fluent assertions? Because before it, it had suggested not using fluent assertions. Anyway, okay. And then the other thing you do here is we need some test cases, right? So um, this is just a feature of, of NUnit. I don't know if you haven't done a whole lot of unit testing. Um, all right, these are the arguments that will go in. So to get from ABC to ABC, it's zero. And I was giving that cat, bat, cats, you know, whatever example before, but it's hard to come up with examples that make sense because I think it's better to just use straight up letters and not try to get cute with, with animal names. But um, <laughs> I said cute as I was typing. Okay, so the other thing you might do is ABC to ABC D. That has a distance of one, right? That's easy to know. Um, but let's try and get some, oh, I shouldn't have done that because... Uh, 
Wait, what? Doesn't middle click? Ugh, I can never remember. Is it Alt for? Yeah, OK. OK, <laughs> for selecting uh, rectangles of text. OK, uh, another change you might make. Well, let's t test putting a letter in front. That should still be a distance of 1. Uh, let's replace every single letter. That should be a distance of 3 because we've changed all of them. Um, one of the cases that I was referencing before where it's a little ambiguous is what if you do something like this? This should be, there's two ways you can get to this string. Either you could replace every single character. A could become Z, B could become A, and C could become B. Or you could prefix a Z and remove a C, which is only two. So this is, I feel like, kind of an interesting test. Like, you should give me a two here. Don't give me a three, <laughs> right? If you've, if you've done the Levenstein uh, distance thing properly. Um, other things, I don't know, you might just add a few letters. And maybe we should test and make sure it, uh, you know, I didn't say anything about uppercase or lowercase. So let's make sure that that is, um, you know, a distance. And I don't know, let's try putting numbers in between. That should be a distance of two. I don't know. There's probably other good tests to think about here that I'm failing to think about. But um, now for the moment of truth, has Copilot, right? This is the whole thing. Do you think, do you trust Copilot? Well, no. But you write a unit test. <laughs> and now we can trust that Copilot has generated for me the correct code um, because our test says so. And again, there, I don't know. Unit tests, I've worked at so many jobs, teams of varying sizes, where for the most part, at least in my experience, the vast majority of people don't even worry about unit tests. And the vast majority of companies don't seem to worry about unit testing. Um, but there was one, uh, two jobs ago, they super cared. And that's where I really actually finally learned because we had. I don't know. I felt like at previous jobs of something people were saying, we should be doing this, and there would be these occasional pushes, but then it wouldn't actually be done <laughs> for any significant amount of time. Um, and honestly, the two jobs I've had since, unit testing is uh, not so required. I think it's going to start getting required at my current job. Um, I'm pushing for that a little, but I should be pushing more. I don't know. It's really easy to get lazy. It really does require like buy-in from everyone that, yes, we are doing this. Um, and we're getting there at my new job. Things are coming together. Um, which is good, but I mean, you know, and if I'm being honest, I'm happy to be lazy, so I don't know. But write unit tests. Unit tests are great. So other reasons you should write unit tests, it really does force your code to just be a little cleaner. Like, like once you have to test some code, in order to make it testable, you tend to end up cleaning up some things. It, you should unit test. Um, but another, this is a great re other reason, and it's not that hard, right? Like, especially for an algorithm this simple. Um, does this do the job it's supposed to be here? My test case is done. Um, so great. So this is another example. I thought of one more example that I thought I would go through um, of a thing we could ask Copilot to do. Another, another example of here's something I kind of know how to write a unit test for. So, so let me get into it. So let's make, let's make some geometry thing. Um, geometry. Oh, and we can see, spoilers, you may have looked at the tabs, right? Air of a triangle. How would you write an algorithm to compute the area of a triangle given three points? If you look online, just like a quick search for compute the area of a triangle, most of them will assume that you have a base that's um, like parallel to the x-axis, like something you could sit flat on a table is kind of how I think about it. I'm sure mathematicians have better ways to describe these things. Um, and that's like one half base times height or something. One half times the base length times the height of the triangle. Uh, but cool, but what if you've got a triangle like this that's kind of jaunty, right? Um, how do you just have three points and find an area? That seems like a much more common case. So, spoilers, I already loaded this up. This was good to find because it did take a little, just a little bit of Googling to find something that enter three points instead of enter the base and enter the height, which I, that, I think that like brings me back to elementary school or middle school. It must be middle school. I don't think they teach you geometry in elementary school. That is middle school or something. Anyway, um, yeah, it took a little while to find a calculator that does it this way. And the reason why this is so useful, I mean, they also tell you the math here. But let's say I even look at this and go, oh my god, how will I type that in C sharp? Let's let, let Copilot do it. This at least lets me generate some test cases. So this is one, right? I can put in these points, know that the area should be this, and that can be my unit test test data, just as I had done here. And so even though I don't know, how, like Levenstein distance, right, I can do in my head. Here's a case where I can't do it in my head, but I can find a little tool that does it. And we can write test cases just the same. So let's do geometry. I don't know. By this point, I feel like I've explained the whole thing, and so there's nothing more to watch. And 
you know, go ahead and you can just stop watching the video. Who even cares? Um, <laughs> this is me being bad at YouTube because I also don't care about that. Um, oh, this should be public and get set. Don't forget to like that bell. Don't actually, do, don't do that. I hate that stuff. Okay, don't do it. Okay, um, I don't know why, what kind of autocomplete was putting extra curly braces. It's probably something better I could have done. It's my fault, right? It's not the ID's fault. Um, anyway, okay, we have a point. That's what we're going to need. Um, and this time I'm going to do it, uh, you know, maybe the way some people might have preferred to do the Levenstein distance thing is rather than extending some sort of class, uh, I'm going to make this geometry class kind of like math. You know, you'd say math.max. We're going to say geometry dot area of triangle. So let's make that public double area of triangle. And we'll need P1, P2, P3. And hopefully, Copilot will suggest something to us. Compute the area of a triangle given three points, P1, P2, and P3. Return zero. It's really not what I was hoping for. <laughs> OK, I'm having some trouble. OK, uh, having some trouble? Did I say trouble? I'm having some trouble. Let's try this. Will this make it a little happier? The area is half the cross product of the two vectors. Um, is that true? Uh, okay, we're even getting some background. That's, I mean, I don't know. I, I would hesitate to include comments written by <laughs> the AI because I can't unit test those and I don't want to lie to my fellow programmers. All right, here we go. And this looks a little more promising. We're finding some distance and just from looking, um, Right, this is distance, square root of, yeah, those are some distances. That, that kind of makes sense. Um, compute the semi-perimeter. Ooh, interesting. Uh, what else you got? Compute the area. Wacky, I think that's, okay. Yeah, we do need math. So here's something else. We don't have a distance between two points. This always, I don't know why, this always kind of amuses me when um, Copilot suggests a function that I haven't even written yet and doesn't exist. It's like, okay, we're going to write that function? And then Copilot's like, yeah, we'll write that function. Um, wow, and with so many comments, compute the distance between two points. Oh, because it <laughs> it copied my style. I, I love when Copilot does that stuff. That's so weird. It's like, I'm going to tell you what they are. Um, between two points, yep. Between the x, compute the distance. <sighs> That's so interesting. It's so weird to see um, to see it do stuff like that. I don't know why I'm finagling that or whatever I'm uh, finessing that's the word I actually wanted all right we have a function that says it computes the area of a triangle I mean this looks pretty similar to what's going on up here right so like it's probably right yeah here's our divided by two so I don't know there's a, there's an extra square root that's a little interesting to me but I don't know you know so I don't know what we'll, we'll hear this is the whole point do we trust this code no so let's write a uh, let's write a test for it so um, we're going to public void uh, test area of triangle and we're going to need three points. I will call them points A, B, and C just to be uh, expected value, sure. Um, just to be consistent with, I don't know, the other test. Uh, that is not how we do that, but <laughs> it's interesting that it guessed that. Again, seems to be very good at looking at what I have written. Um, and here's another fiddly detail that you should be aware of. <laughs> Whenever you're comparing doubles and floats, you cannot do a strict equality. Um, this is a fun thing people, I, hold on, let me see. I think it's be, yeah, be approximately. Okay, so what am I doing? Let me show you. I think this is best illustrated with JavaScript. People like to do this to say like, this is why your, your language of choice is bad. It can't even add numbers. This is like a trick people like to play on the internet. So what do you think is 0.01 plus 0.02? Yeah, JavaScript says it's point, sorry, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. JavaScript says 0 0.3 zzz, 0 0.4. Obviously incorrect. And people will say these kinds of things and be like, ho, 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 this is why JavaScript sucks. <laughs> C Sharp does the exact same thing. Um, I was able to do this in LinkPad, although I was having mixy results. By the way, if you don't know about LinkPad, it's really good. Oh, uh, oh God. Oh, it apparently has updates for me. Hey, internet, you get to watch me do LinkPad updates. Um, yeah, get out of here. LinkPad, what are you doing? Okay, so I tried doing this, and it didn't actually give me a super funny result. 
but I was able to get the result by doing like something like this and then I think that ends up giving me no let's see if they're equals ah there we go there it says it's false it's possible that link pad is outputting and doing some rounding but but so let's try this does 0.1 plus 0.2 equal 0.3 what do you think yeah okay there you go c sharp says nope that's not true okay so this is what i could have done from the beginning it's interesting that um yeah i don't know if it's just a feature of link where it's doing a little bit of extra rounding or something but this is the fundamental problem and again all languages exhibit this behavior it's because you know, just like you can't express two-thirds in base 10 perfectly, you'd write 0.6666666 and eventually decide seven maybe, and now you it's no longer accurate, right? The same thing is happening here, but we're working in base two, and so some things that are expressible easily in base 10 um, are not expressible in base two um, so conveniently, so... That's that's what we're seeing here. So anyway, people, if you ever see anyone pull this trick online and say, your programming language is stupid because it can't add 0.1 to 0.2, um, that person is trying to trick you. Um, so anyway, <laughs> that person's being mean. On the internet? I can't believe it. Um, okay, so the whole point, <laughs> and uh, Fluent Assertions has this built in. Um, you, you can't just do a strict equality. So usually what you do, and, and you'll see math for this online too, um, but you check within some super tiny, you know, differences. Like, okay, well, do they differ by 0.01 or do they differ by some percent of one of the two values or something like that? And the percent thing is actually better um, when you have really big values because uh, the bigger your value, the fewer decimal points you get um, with floating in doubles. All right, so you've got like 10 digits to the left, you only get like three to the right or something. I made those numbers up, whereas if you have zero digits to the left, then you get all like 14 to the right or something. You know, Again, I don't know what the exact number of digits are. And again, it's not decimal digits, it's binary two digits. It's, it's bananas. I don't, I don't know double math well enough. I know well enough uh, to know that you have to be careful. So anyway, that has nothing to do with copilot or unit testing. Um, just we have to compare our doubles properly. Okay, so here's another thing. Um, I'll just write this out, but I know it's not going to work. We cannot say new point, new point. Oh, also, I don't have these constructors. Okay, so that's one problem. Let's make that constructor, and I bet you Copilot will be happy to do it. Perfect. Um, but you still can't do this because of this reason. An attribute argument must be a constant expression. Um, yeah, actually, that's a good. I'm sure there's a good technical reason why that's true. At first, I was thinking it makes sense, but I think it just makes sense to me because I'm used to it. <laughs> it's like, well, why can't it evaluate that at compile time? I don't know. Anyway, so um, and unit has a has a little thing you do instead. You can give it a test case source, and you have to name it. So we should make our test case source first. And I have notes on how to do this because I always forget. Um, yeah, it's a little wacky. And there's a couple ways you can do it. You can point to uh, an I enumerable or a function that's an I enumerable, and you can use yields in there and do some nice fun stuff. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna do it this way. So we'll do our uh, triangle test data, um, and these are also new objects. So then this becomes our list of parameters. So interesting hint from <laughs> uh, Copilot there. But let's do this. So this is, if you wanna think about this case, um, so we've got a point at the origin at zero, zero. Then we go one over, but no up. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and zero over and one up. And so this makes a tiny triangle where the two sides are adjacent to the axes. Maybe I should just draw what I'm doing here. Um, right, so we're doing a triangle kind of like this. And then let me get red. Um, so I'm doing a triangle that's like, like that, right? So one over, one up make this a triangle, and this area is easy to compute in your head because we've done half of a square. Oh, the area is a half, done. Um, so that's easy enough, uh, but again, why am I moving this off monitor? I don't want this anymore, get out of here. Uh, again, we're gonna want some more interesting test cases. We're gonna want to test a variety of things. Also, this one is already aligned with, with the x-axis. Well, is that axis aligned? Is that the fun technical math term? I don't know. I watch some math videos on YouTube, but not enough to, to know these things. Um, all right, name of, and I don't test that knowledge. Sometimes I wonder about that. I don't know, I watch a lot of you know educational videos on YouTube and it makes me feel smart, but I don't actually practice it, so I'm sure a lot of it is just forgotten the next day. 
Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's more of a uh, philosophical life problem or something. Um, okay, let's arrange some things so we can see what we're doing. I'll stop rambling about philosophy or whatever I was doing. Um, all right, so negative two, three, and new point, um, negative three, negative one, new point, three, negative two. And this is an interesting test case too. So not only is it, um, oh, what was the word I used? Not a skew, jaunty. Not only is it a little jaunty, right? It's not aligned with, with um, any particular axis. Um, it's also got negative numbers, which is a good thing to test. There are plenty of cases in algorithms where negative numbers might throw you off if you've got moduluses or something else. So yeah, good to test some negative numbers. Um, let's, I don't know, come up with some other examples. Let's do like, uh, let's do some big random numbers. Ooh, ooh, actually, no, I know another one we should do. I don't think I need, I think this is gonna be an area of zero, right? Because it, it'll be a straight line. There we go, yeah. So that's an interesting test to, to case where our um, three points form a line. Um, the area should be zero. Um, I know I said three, three, but I'll just do two, two. I mean, you know, we can, you know, it doesn't matter. And there's probably better ways that to, uh, what's going on? Oh, I'm missing a comma. Um, it's often helpful when you're, when you're writing unit tests, you want to, um, Things like this would make someone potentially suspicious, like, well, why 2,000, you know? Um, you know, I should just do two for that reason. Um, I thought it might, you know, I don't know, let's stress out the formula by doing bigger values, but I don't think that's really gonna matter. Um, ooh, something else we haven't tested, though, uh, is fractional values. So what if we said, oh, oh, um, yeah, well, you know, let's test both. I don't know if it's a good idea to test both cases at once, but what if we did 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then, uh, I don't know, 0 0.75, 0 0.75, whatever. Doesn't really matter. Um, ooh, or do we wanna, oh yeah. I don't know, do we wanna get some horrible, uh, since we were just talking about the issues with, with rounding and everything? Um, that's not expressible in, in base two without repeating values, so. So yeah, okay, let's do this. Let's say this is good enough. I don't know, there's probably better triangle test points I could think about. I've already gone on way too long with this stuff. Uh, the whole point is writing unit tests for your, your code um, that you, you found on the internet, or in this case, from Copilot. Is Copilot trustworthy? So the reason, great, this algorithm works. The reason I thought this was interesting, again, is I saw people online complaining that Copilot had bugs because it was generating buggy or insecure code. No, you can't trust it. Like, it, it's never going to be perfect at that. It can never know everything that you want to do. You have to test it. You have to test what your, what your crazy code is. Whether you wrote it, whether you found it online, um, whether it's from Copilot, you should be unit testing. Again, maybe just because of my own personal experience, I'm not going to blame anyone too hard for not writing unit tests all the time. There's lots of stuff where it's like, you know, you just test it and it works and, and it was simple and who wants to do all that trouble? Um, but there are good reasons to do it, again, uh, besides making sure things work, um, like uh, fixing up your code and making sure things don't get broken later. That, that's another good reason. Um, I think also just my hobby of doing games, um, making games, there's, I feel like unit testing comes up a little less or is just a little more awkward because you've got more random numbers or it's about physics. And like, what does it mean to unit test physics? I just want to make sure the jump feels right, right? How do you unit test? Does it feel right? So there's a lot of things like that that just, I don't know, to me don't seem to lend themselves to, to unit testing as much. So I don't do it as much as, as I probably should. Um, so anyway, there you go. Unit test your copilot code. Um, it's not too hard to do. Uh, and unless you just can't even write the unit test, then you're in trouble and you need to go find help as I did <laughs> when trying to do those LDAP queries. So hopefully this was interesting. I still think Copilot is pretty cool and fun. Try it out. No one's paying me to say anything. Don't click the like button. I don't know. Goodbye. <laughs>